So, Galileo proved, basically, that the planets go around the sun. And he was only house arrested and had to save lots of psalms every day and he couldn't go into his garden. Oh, and he went blind. But apart from that, he was lucky to get off alive with the Inquisition. Next greatest scientist was an Englishman who even Einstein says is the greatest scientist of all time. Okay. So, what did he do? Well, he invented the reflecting telescope, the basis of all the biggest telescopes in the world. At the moment, the biggest telescope is in South Africa, about 11 and a half metres. And on the horizon is a telescope that's going to be 42 metres across. What else? He did Newton's laws of motion, he did the universal law of gravity, he proved that Kepler's laws came from his universal law of gravity. He was the greatest scientist. But they didn't know about the distance to stars. By about 1750, a Durham man, why a Durham man, decided that, you know the Milky Way, have you all seen the Milky Way? We live in a galaxy called the Milky Way. He knew that. Then the great Herschel, another uh, man who discovered Uranus. I'm now going to say Uranus and not Uranus because that's how you pronounce it. Isn't that true, Tim? <laughs> so, don't worry about it. It's not rude. So the fact is that Uranus <laughs> suddenly doubled the size of the solar system. But he still hadn't measured the distance to stars. By 1800, we discovered these tiny little asteroids. It was like an, a little planet, but um, they were very, very small indeed. By 1838, the instruments were so accurate, we measured the nearest star in 61 Cygni, 11 light years away. If we take a space probe, the fastest one we've got, more than 50,000 years to go to that star. 50,000 years, travelling at very high velocity, about 60 kilometres per second. So. So we now measured the distance to stars, we started to know about our galaxy, but there were funny little images. There was a man who lived in Ireland who had the largest telescope. It was six foot across, between me and Peter Kalinsky there. A great big mirror, huge big telescope, very unwieldy, but he had a go. And he saw nebulae. Now nebulae is Latin for clouds. <laughs> of course. They started to think perhaps they were like our galaxy with stars and gas, dust and gas and things like that. But there was a great big debate. Now, I'm sorry that I haven't mentioned many ladies. Ladies are obviously as clever as men, but they were unfortunately put down for the first 2,000 years. Luckily, they've been rising up. Uh, Margaret Thatcher. Anyway, <laughs> I knew that would get along. Right. <laughs> so, the fact is, Henrietta Leavitt, I mean, can you imagine calling her in for lunch? Henrietta? Your dinner's ready. Anyway, Henrietta was a very diligent woman, and in about 1912, she discovered a relationship. All the stars in one of the Magellanic clouds must be at the same distance. They all belong together. And they found that the brightest stars had a longest period of variability, say 100 days. And these stars are so old, they pulsate. When we get to our age, Ron, yeah, we start to pulsate. Sometimes I get fat and sometimes... Christmas I get fat and sometimes I get thin. Depends if I go to pulse gym or not. You go to pulse gym. Anyway, so there we are. We're pulsating. And they found, she found rather, that the longer it takes to pulsate, the brighter. And it's a bit like me going to a light bulb. That's a 100 watt light bulb. That's a 60 watt light bulb. That's a 150 watt light bulb. If I know the intrinsic brightness and I measure the apparent brightness, I can work out if it's a million light years away, 100,000 light years. And she did that. And you know what? It was further than any star in our galaxy. It wasn't in our galaxy. It was in another galaxy. In another galaxy. So one of them said, the universe consists of more than one galaxy. No, 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 we live in, we just live in, a, in one galaxy. Those are just silly little clouds. Anyway, there's a great debate, and Edwin Hubble won, uh, using Henrietta Leavitt's work. Well done, Edwin. You also slightly, um, you know when you're a great scientist, and you've got some data, and you want to prove a theory, sometimes you get a pen, and you wipe out the bits of data you don't like. So he drew a graph of velocity against distance. So he knew the distance to this galaxy it was travelling that fast. He knew the distance to this galaxy twice as far away, and it was going twice as fast. And he drew a beautiful straight line. Now, if you look at the original data, it's not a beautiful straight line. But when you're a great scientist, you just get rid of the data you don't like, and you can prove what you want. The fact is, he was right. 
The further you go into the universe, the faster those galaxies are traveling. This means if I was doing this video here, and you were all expanding and traveling away from each other, where were you a few seconds ago? Here. Where were you a few seconds ago? Here. Where were you a few seconds ago? You were all together. And the idea of the Big Bang started to grow. And George Gamow in 1948 propounded that we all started as a massive atom which blew up many billions of years ago. Of course, if it was true, and you always develop your theory, and you have possible clues, you have evidence, you want evidence to prove your theory, where is the background radiation that's left over? If there was this big explosion and the radiation spread out over billions of years, where is this radiation? But of course, the techniques in those days weren't very good. Radio astronomy started in 1931, but in 1965, using a beautiful microwave detector, seven meter dish, they discovered the background radiation. And that shows you, along with other evidence, that the Big Bang Theory is the best we've got at the moment, the very best theory we've got at the moment. The evidence for the Big Bang developed. Um, if you look at the universe, 90% is hydrogen, 9% is helium, and 1% is the rest. You only get that in the first three minutes of a Big Bang. You don't get that in stars. Oh, 1957. Burbage, Burbage, Fowler and Hoyle, Fowler, the great English astronomer, managed to show through theory that all the elements after helium, including iron, which is possibly in your watch, and iron, which is in your blood, came from stars. And even the elements beyond iron, in a supernova explosion, you produce all the elements up to uranium and beyond. And so this was another nail in the coffin of another theory called the steady state theory propounded by Sir Fred Hoyle, which is fascinating. He didn't like the Big Bang Theory, obviously. Now, what have we got? If you look very carefully at the universe, which is now 13.7 billion years old, that part of the universe looks very similar to that part. How can you do that? Well, somebody called Alan Guth. I think his name's Guthrie, sorry, 1980, he developed the idea of an inflationary universe. Nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. You can't. Even an electron can't. Oh, no, sir. No. Even if I used every single piece of energy in the whole universe, I can get you up to 99.99999% of the speed of light. Okay? Yeah. No, no. But space is not matter. And space, the galaxies sit in space, and the space moved apart. So that was the latest idea. The next thing I think we should talk about is the Hubble Space Telescope, which is as big as a double-decker bus, and it has produced beautiful pictures, only a mirror 2.4 metres across. That's all, 2.4 metres across. Remember, on the Earth, we've got mirrors 11 metres across. But of course, there's no atmosphere. There's no clouds, there's no dust. You can observe 24 hours a day. And it's been doing that for 21 years. And there is a picture most beautiful picture I've ever seen. I want you to hold a grain of sand at arm's length on the sky. All of you now do that. Good. Well done. <laughs> I will show you the picture tomorrow. There are 10,000 galaxies being counted in that. And then you work out how many of those grains would fill the whole sky. 41,000 square degrees. And the answer is... 100 billion galaxies, each galaxy 100 billion stars. More stars than our grains of sand on the beaches. Okay, so we've now got up to 1990. Um, I think I'll stop with the following thoughts, right? A lot of presenters, and you've seen some TV programs recently, I suppose, might talk about, well, I don't know, has anyone seen a program about Galileo or Sir Isaac Newton? Not, 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 not often. What about the developments over the next 10 years? The next 10 years we'll have a mirror between here and that kid's game, three times bigger, a billion euros. That's the optical part. Every time we open up a part of the electromagnetic spectrum, be it radio, microwaves, infrared, that looks at stars that are being born, light, obviously stars give out light, ultraviolet, the most energetic things like the sun's corona give off, ultraviolet and x-rays, and the most violent things of all, supernovae or neutron stars collapsing or black holes hitting each other and colliding, give out gamma rays. 
in the 1960s they were worried about the Soviet Union. Perhaps they might put bombs in outer space. They saw flashes of gamma rays. Were they bombs? Shall we launch the missiles now? Luckily they didn't. Uh, the fact is, they were gamma ray bursters, and these GRBs, gamma ray bursters, are at the very edge of the universe, and we believe that's where black holes were forming in galaxies. Every galaxy seems to have a supermassive black hole, even our galaxy has a million, four million solar mass black hole, with stars whizzing round close to the speed of light. It's not switched on because it's not gobbling up, but if you go to a really good galaxy like M87, it's gobbling up 600 Earths a minute, and it's spewing out X-rays and gamma rays, and it's the most energetic thing. Every time you open up a window, you discover things. What's coming up? Who's heard of gravitational waves? They have an instrument in America that is more than four miles long, no, sorry, four kilometers, and they are trying to detect when a gravitational wave comes along. It will change the length of that arm. So small that it's one thousandth of the diameter of an atom. How can they measure it? Well, they haven't yet, but they're going to try. And then they're going to put three satellites in orbit called LISA. Nice name for a satellite, except it's three. And these are millions of kilometers apart, and they fire lasers and if a gravitational wave comes along, this whole arm will move by a hundredth of the diameter of a hydrogen atom. Now, they can measure that. 